So should we talk? Hello. Hey hello. everyone. Um, hello Julian and and he hello everyone. And welcome to this yet another presentation about reactive programming, great reactive libraries. And today we have great expert Julian. Hello Julian. How are you doing? Hey, hi. Nice to see all of you. Um, I just wish I was in Russia, but you know, this was you know, the some kind of history, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, well, thanks for having me. I'm really pleased to be uh, at this conference. Yeah, so before we start, let me quickly introduce to you Julian. Julian is a great person. He is reactive expert. And I love when we talk about reactive programming. Yet another talk about reactive programming at great conference. It's always great. So Julian is an expert and he's working on the reactive library called Mutini. So this is another library which give you reactive library asynchronous uh, programming aspects for, for writing non-blocking and async applications doing it better than just in an imperative way. Um, and uh, Julian, along, along just Mutini, he's working on, on library uh, Vertex. He's, he's maintaining Quarkus. And today he will be talking about all these libraries. So if you had questions to Mutini, to Vertex or to Quarkus, it's a great chance to learn more about those library and ask questions at the very end of this presentation to Julian. So Julian, did I miss anything about, about um, what you're doing today? No, you could just do my own shameless plug to say I wrote a book called Vertex in Action at my name, which is great. That's it. <laughs> so um, today you're talking about Vertex, Quarkus and, and Mutini. So should we just start, or you want to do some some short intro that everyone has to has to know about? No, I think it's fine. It's a, it's really a journey of, about you know the reactive stack that we've been at Red Hat and the various pieces and all the fit together. So I think yeah, you can just start the uh, presentation. Hello and welcome to this talk called Simply Reactive, where we'll be discussing four things. We'll be discussing Vertex, Mutiny, Hibernate Reactive, and Quarkus. So let me show you the uh, agenda. Um, it's really all about the reactive continuum that we've been developing at Red Hat. Um, and we do care a lot about reactive because we want people to be able to develop services that are resource efficient. And if you develop resource efficient services, um, the great thing is that given some hardware that you have, uh, which may be in the cloud, which may be on-premise, which may be on hybrid clouds, uh, basically, you're going to be able to deploy more instances on the same hardware. Um, we'll be talking about Vertex, which is a great and simple reactive toolkit for the JVM. Um, so it's a really solid foundation if you want to develop resource-efficient services. Um, and then we'll be talking about other projects. Um, so Mutiny, which is our reactive programming library. Hibernate, which is now reactive. And we'll be discussing how Vertex, Hibernate, and Mutiny fit together in the context of Quarkus. And Quarkus is our um, brilliant framework for doing all kinds of services, including modern reactive services. Um, so why reactive matters? Um, it matters because if you take the classic stacks that are associating one thread for each new connection, you're wasting lots of resources uh, because threads are not cheap. Uh, they consume hardware. And the more threads you have competing, um, the more pressure you're putting on the kernel scheduler of your operating system, which is an issue. Um, so very quickly, your scalability is going to be limited by the fact that you're using blocking IO and this one thread per connection model. Um, it's especially important if you want to build resource efficient services because um, when you put your service in production, it's very likely that your service is running in a container which is maybe running in a virtual machine. Um, so what your process sees as hardware, like the number of CPUs, um, in fact, it's only a tiny share of a CPU, which may be a virtual CPU shared with other virtual machines um, and other co-located services. So what you, you don't really have the view of the real hardware you're using and you're competing with others. 
So it's really important to be able to have um, services that are high, as scalable as possible, but especially um, that you know really take advantage of the hardware resources as much as possible. Um, so the solution for that, we know the solution um, is to, to move from blocking I/O to asynchronous I/O. Um, so moving with to uh, non-blocking I/O, basically, what you get is instead of having one thread for each new connection, you have a very limited num number of threads maybe sometimes just one, and they are multiplexing the processing of many, many, many concurrent connections. Um, so that model, is it, it does scale way better because uh, you, you can deal with more concurrent connections than if you were using the uh, traditional blocking I.O. Uh, by doing so, you're able to put more services instances on some hardware or you know, cloud in, in, in infrastructure, which is great because you're going to save money. Um, so one thing that I should say is that Reactive is not just about um, the ability to, to do non-blocking I.O. It's also about doing um, what we call resident services. So I'm not going to discuss this today, but the idea that your service should be able to always keep the latency under control. Um, so no matter if you have a, a traffic spike and you need to create more instances, which is called elasticity, or if you need to cope with failures because say your database is down, in all these cases, so scaling or crashing, uh, in all these cases, your service has to keep the latency under control and still become responsive. That's really the, the key thing. Um, and by doing so, you're going to move to event-driven programming, which means that you're going to write code that does respond to events. And it's a very nice model and you may be already familiar with, with this model if you've done some uh, GUIs, uh, front-end programming, et cetera, because it's a very natural model um, in this context. So I don't want to have too many slides. Um, I want to show you demos. Um, so there will be three demos. Um, the first one I'm going to show you Vertex and then Vertex um, and the SQL clients uh, that are really efficient. And then I will discuss Hibernate Reactive. Um, so I will show you how to integrate Hibernate Reactive with a Vertex application and take advantage of Mutiny to compose asynchronous operations. And finally, I will show you all everything fits together uh, in the context of Quarkus um, because Vertex is a toolkit, so you need to assemble all the pieces by yourself to, uh, to make your application. And in Quarkus, it's a framework that we have. So we provide you with an, you know, a more guided experience to developing your services. Um, and we also provide uh, lots of really cool stuff like reloading application, uh, automatically starting uh, tests, et cetera, because you know, it's a framework. Um, so let me show you some Vertex. Um, so to get started with the Vertex, um, and I'm, I'm, going, I'm actually going to use just one single class like this. Uh, and this class is called main. Um, so the thing is, it extends something called abstract vertical. Um, so what you need to know is in vertex te terminology, the vertical is the unit of deployment. So if you have something that is going to process events, like an, an API that talks to a database, or you're listening on, on some message queue or something like this, you're going to encapsulate all the logic in a vertical. And the vertical has a very simple life cycle with a start and a stop method. Um, so in this case, I'm going to write the code in the, in the stop method. Oops, let's go back to this one. Um, so once you are in the, um, in, in, in the vertical class, you have a, a field which is called vertex, and that's your vertex context. Um, so you can do lots of things with it. Uh, you, create, you can create HTTP servers, HTTP clients, uh, UDP clients and, so, um, client and servers. Uh, you can create DNS. Um, you can do you know, all the network things um, that may be of interest. Um, I'm going to do something simple to get started. I'm going to create uh, a periodic task every three seconds. And every three seconds, I'm going to log what's happening. 
So I will lock tick like this. And I'm going to do something else. So I'm going to, of course, create an HTTP server because everyone wants to see an HTTP server. So I have a request handler, uh, which is going to deal with processing of my, uh, uh, of my request. Uh, and then I need to listen on some port. So I'm going to use 8080, which is very typical. And I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, so I'm going to log because again, logging will be useful to show you something. Um, so I will say HTTP request received like this. And I'm going to respond with, you know, I go to the response and I end the uh, request with hello, Joker, com, like this. Um, so I'm going, so that's, so that, that's more or less it. Like I create my HTTP server. I say how I want to process the, um, the request. I say, I want to, to be bound to port 8080 and then you need to um, to respond to the HTTP server being launched um, because either it will succeed because the TCP port is free and you've been able to bind to it, or maybe you have another process which is taking that port and you will fail because you, you can't start it. So listen is giving us a future uh, and I can respond to um, the success or the failure. So in case of success, I'm going to say, okay, and log that, you know, my server is running. So I will say info um, server is running like this. And in case of failure, um, so I'm given a throwable, I'm going to log the, this, uh, this problem, say, whoops, all, oh, and that should be. So the idea is, when you listen, it's an asynchronous operation. Um, in case of success, this callback will be, will be called. In case of failure, this one will be called. And every time you get um, an HTTP request, this Lambda is going to be called, that's my handler. And every three seconds, this Lambda is going to be called with a tick. Um, so that's my vertical and now I need to deploy it. So to deploy, I need in my main method to create a, a vertex context like this, equals vertex, and then I need to deploy my vertical. So you say deploy vertical, uh, there are several ways to do it because you can create multiple instances if you want to, or you can uh, allocate like this or with its supplier. So there are many, many ways. And then I'm going to run it. Um, so it will, it will start extremely fast because uh, there's not much to do. So there are no classes to discover or anything. Um, so my server is running, which is great. And I get a tick and, a, and another tick. Um, I'm going to take another shell to make an HTTP request. Uh, and I'm to, actually, I'm going to do a bunch of requests like this. So I'm going to use WRK, uh, which is a load testing tool which is going to run for 10 seconds and do a request. And if you look into the logs, you see tons of you know, log entries for the HTTP um, request and the ticks. So I'm going to stop it here. Um, so there's not much to read from the, uh, the, the latency report of WRK because it's running on, on the same machine, et cetera. So it doesn't mean anything. Um, although I've had lots of requests being done in 10 seconds. Um, but what's really interesting here is that if you look at the logs, you see that we have just one thread. So all the requests, the ticks, and all the HTTP um, requests have been processed on that vertex event loop thread. And this is because every time you have um, a vertical, that vertical is going, be, is going to be attached to the same event loop thread. And we say it's an event loop uh, because it's processing events, asynchronous events, as they arrive uh, in the loop. And that's it. So I have an HTTP request. I call the handler. And when it's done, I can process another event, which may be another HTTP request, or which may be the periodic task that I had, etc. cetera. Um, so if you know Node, for example, it's and that kind of model, except that in the case of Vertex, 
Uh, you can have multiple event loops because you have multiple vertical inst instances running in your process. Um, but basically, yeah, that's quite interesting to see that we have one thread, um, which means that when you write code like in your vertical, um, you don't need to care about concurrency. Uh, for example, if you want to store something, you can you know, store in a field like this, um, which may be an array list, for example. So you do an array list of, I don't know, string, for example. Uh, my list equals new array list. So if you have something like this, um, yeah, I just need to import. That's it. So if you have this, for example, uh, you can access my list without having any concurrency issue uh, because you know that when you access, access it, nobody else is running, uh, is going to access it concurrently because it's an event loop. Um, so that's to get you started with what's vertex and what it's like. It's very, very simple. Um, so, of course, you can do lots and lots of things with uh, Vertex, from IoT um, to gateways to microservices to whatever you want, integration, anything. Um, so, the Vertex project, is it's an Eclipse Foundation project, and there is the core stack, which we maintain. And in this stack, you will see many things. So, for example, you will see all the reactive database drivers um, that I will talk later on in this talk. Uh, you have messaging, so if you want to talk to Stomp, MQP, Kafka, whatever, we have, uh, we have drivers. Uh, if you do web APIs, um, you have all the stuff for advanced routing, open it API integration, etc. Um, if you want to do some clustering, so having multiple instances of um, your application that talk to each other. Uh, we have a clustering support and an eventing system, which is called the event bus, so that verticals can talk to each other, even over the network, if need be. Um, of course, security and authentication. So we have pretty much all you would need to, be, to do a, a typical service. Um, then if you don't find something you need, like a database driver for something we don't have in the stack, you have the Reactivus project, um, which is a set of projects that are closely related to Vertex, but not in the core stack. And then, of course, you have the wider community, which is big, and you are likely to find um, some, some clients for some exotic database or other helpers uh, library that we can have um, in the stack. Uh, if you want to know more about Vertex, and that's my one minute of shameless plug, um, I wrote a book called Vertex in Action at Manning. Um, it's not just about Vertex, actually. It's really about how you make uh, asynchronous programming simple in Java with Vertex. Uh, but I also teach you in this book the principle of reactive uh, ap applications. So not just about scaling because you have asynchronous I.O., uh, but also all you need to do for uh, being fault tolerant and resilient and, you know, having uh, responsive services. So that's the end of my uh, shameless plug. Um, so because you're doing asynchronous programming, let's face it, um, asynchronous programming is complicated. It's not simple. Uh, it's harder than, you know, imperative programming with blocking IO, which is more traditional. Asynchronous programming has challenges. Um, so when you want to compose asynchronous operations, like you get an HTTP request, um, you make a query to your database, and then once you have the result, you want to push something to Kafka and then respond to uh, the HTTP request. If you want to do this with asynchronous um, operations, you need a programming model that makes it easy. Um, the most primitive um model you can find is the callbacks. Um, so basically you register a function or a lambda, uh, which is going to be called for any any time some event happens, like um, you say, I want to read some bytes from the from a TCP connection, 
So your callback is going to be called when the bytes are actually available. Um, but the issue with callbacks is that it, 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 that it can lead to very complex and convoluted code uh, with nested callbacks and stuff, which is really horrible. Um, so one model which is nice is the model of future and promises. Uh, just like we had in the sample where we wanted to uh, await for, well, to not, not await, but to respond to uh, the HTTP server being up and running. Uh, future and promises are great if you want to chain asynchronous operations. So if you want to express how you chain one operation, then the other, then the other, etc. Um, so if you have something which is linear, it's great. Um, and it's fairly simple to, um, to comprehend. If you have streams of events, um, and if you want to have a declarative way to say how you deal with failure, how you deal with uh, retry policies, etc., cetera, um, you may have a better luck by moving to reactive extensions, uh, which we'll be talking because Mutiny uh, is an implementation of reactive extensions uh, for Java. And then you will find other models um, that people find popular, like coroutines. So if you know Kotlin coroutines, um, this is a great example of a coroutine implementation. Um, the idea is that it is to hide the asynchronous, the fact that you're doing asynchronous I/O. Um, so you program in something that looks like classic imperative programming, but under the hood, your code is going to be split in continuations of asynchronous uh, event processing. So in some cases, it can be nice. Um, but again, if you have streams, uh, maybe you should look into reactive extensions and not coroutines. Um, something I need to say is that there's no good or bad model. Um, it all depends what kind of problem you have and what kind of processing you need to do um, what kind of asynchronous um, problem you have. So depending on what you have to write, you will need to choose one or the other. And it's the great thing about Vertex uh, is that you, have, you, you can use all these models in Vertex um, and you can really pick the one that suits your problem. So talking about reactive extensions and reactive streams, um, we have Mutiny, uh, which is not the first library uh, in the space for Java. Uh, Eric's Java and Reactor were there before. Um, but still, we decided to develop our own uh, reactive programming library. Um, we did so not because we wanted to have our own library, but because we thought there were problems with the existing libraries. Um, so to show you, the first problem that we had was uh, what we call the monad hell. Um, so the, the example on the left is taken from my book. And in this code, um, I'm making a first HTTP request. Then at some point, I do another one. Uh, it's the who owns device method uh, in the Lambda. Uh, then I have another one, which is fill with user profile. So basically, I'm chaining three, um, three and maybe four, actually, four, four asynchronous operations. Um, and if you look at the code, um, so there are things you can understand, like delay, uh, retry, we understand that. And it's a great thing about reactive extensions. Um, it's all declarative. Like if you want to wait, you say delay five seconds. Um, retry five means you can retry up to five times if you have a problem with the operations above. So for example, if the initial request fails, um, you can retry up to five times. So that's great because it's declarative uh, and it can be more it can be complicated to do in imperative code actually. So in this case, it, it, it's a bit better. But then if you look at the code, um, you have something like flat map single, which means chaining with another operation. Um, you have flatten as flowable and I don't remember what I had to do it, but I remember in the pipeline I had to do it. So. The, the problem, we think, is all these methods, all these operators, they have functional programming semantics. And if you're a functional programmer and you know what a flat map is, 
and you understand what flat path means in the context of asynchronous IO, then create um, is going to be okay for you. Um, and in six months time, when you get back to this code, you will remember what, what it meant. But unfortunately, not everybody knows functional programming um, and we want to make it more accessible to uh, even more developers. So making reactive programming more accessible is really one key thing uh, when we design Mutiny. Uh, and the other problem on the right is the, the, the problem of navigability. Um, so when you're in your ID and you run the completion, um, you get exposed to a thousand methods. Uh, so all the forms of concat map single, concat width, concat map delay error, uh, all the flat maps. Uh, so there's flat map, flat map single, flat map, whatever, uh, debound. So you get exposed to lots, lots of methods. And, you know, if you do it every day, that's fine because you know which operator you need at some point. Uh, but when you get started with function, uh, reactive programming, so not only you have to understand functional programming, but you also need to find your way around the library operators. Um, so that's why we, in Mutiny, we have an API which is a little more verbose, but we think is more explicit and makes it easier, hopefully, um, to grasp reactive programming in Java. So for example, here, um, you say on item, so it's what you call a group, and then you get exposed only to the methods when you want to process an item, like transform. So on item, transform something. Um, same with failure. You have a group of failures to say on failure, I want to recover with something else, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so hopefully it's a better model. Um, you may ask yourself, what's the performance like of Mutiny and the others? Um, it turns out that we recently published an academic paper on that topic. Um, we analyzed the cost uh, of uh, the, the popular reactive programming libraries in Java, so Eric's Java, Reactor, and Mutiny. And all these libraries, they are being used in the context of asynchronous IO processing because they are all based on top of something called reactive streams, and reactive streams are made for IO. And if you look at it, actually, um, the performance figures are the same for all the libraries. So choosing one library in your stack or the other, it will make a difference um, to your code base, actually. So choose whatever you, whatever you like. Um, it's just great. Uh, but I still encourage you to, to read the paper to find the, the, uh, the other findings, because they're awesome. Um, so let me show you some mutiny. Um, so I'm going to get back to this, uh, to this code. Uh, I'm going to do something very quick and simple to show you some um, some some mutiny. Um, so in mutiny we have two types: uh, uni, it's for one-shot operations, and we have multi, which is for streams. Uh, and the two APIs look pretty much the, the same. So you, we can create a uni from multiple things like a completion stage, um, an item, a failure, an emitter, which is able to bridge with pretty much any kind of uh, source you may have. Uh, but let's do it with an item uh, like 58, like this. So this uni uh, is not actually reactive because it's already bound at creation time by to an item. Um, but then I can do things like on item, uh, transform, so n, and I can do um, n plus, uh, I don't know, bang like this. Um, and then you need to subscribe, because if you don't subscribe, nothing is going to happen. And you can subscribe with uh, some callbacks, like uh, you can have a callback when you get the item, you can have a callback. Uh, with an item and a failure handler, um, a completion handler. So you have all these uh, possibilities. And I'm going to, in, in this case, just subscribe with a subscriber, which is going, print, is, is going to call print line. And that should be it. So if I run this, you will see 58 bang, which is to be expected. Great. Um, and now, if we look into multi, so multi is for streams of events. So you can create 
from a range, for example, from one to a hundred. And then you can do some transformations. Uh, for example, the first one I'm going to select. So only keep the values where some predicate holds. And that predicate is going to be, we want the odd numbers like this. And perhaps we want to skip some elements. So I'm going to say, I want to skip some elements. Um, I want to skip the first, uh, I don't know, 40 items, for example. Um, and then I can do other things. Um, I can react to on item. I can do, again, transformation like this. So N, uh, N plus bank like this. And you know you can do all the other things uh, like you can collect into uh, into list uh, in, into maps. Um, you can group if you want. Like if if you have some um, criterion predicate, you can group by something, and it will give you um, the, the value attached to some key, etc. And we can subscribe, of course, with, with not like this with a subscriber, which is going to be system out print line. So again, um, you can see that, you know, we hope that this is readable and people understand. Um, so again, it's a little more verbose, but, you know, we think it clearly expresses what you want to do uh, when you have to react to events and failures, etc. So you can see that we get all these values just as you would expect. Um, so it's great, um, but now you do, you, you, so sometimes you want to do some things more fancy, and I'm going to show you. Um, so Vertex, Mutiny, plus the reactive SQL drivers. Um, so to do this, I'm going to use uh, a Postgres database. And to start it, I'm going to use this containers, so I don't have to, um, to create it myself. So I'm creating that, that database, uh, and then I'm just deploying a, a vertical. Um, so I'm going to run it because I want to show you what, what it does. Um, so it's a very simple HTTP API um, where you can have products and products you can query. So it's just kind of REST CRUD services, if you will. Um, so you can see that the start is actually very fast in Vertex. Um, you know, just a few milliseconds. Um, the rest was starting the uh, the container. So since it's running, I'm going to make a few queries to the um, database, or well, not to my service, sorry. Um, so you have a first endpoint, which is products, um, which gives you the products, and there are no products. So I'm going to post a product. Uh, it's bread at this price. Um, I can have something else like a baguette, which is another type of French bread, actually. So it's my second item. And if I look at all the products, I get this as JSON data. So nothing too fancy, but it's backed by um, a Postgres database. And you can see that, again, it's all being done on a single event loop thread in Vertex. So dealing with the HTTP request and dealing with the database connection and doing the queries it's all done from a single thread. Um, so if I show you the code, um, to teach you a little more about Vertex, uh, how to use it. So the uh, Postgres database driver connection, um, you access it through some very typical configuration. Um, so I'm just you know, getting the port and host from test containers. So it's something that was passed from my main method here. Um, so when you deploy a vertical like this, actually you can pass some options. And in these options, uh, you can pass a JSON object uh, with pretty much any key value or configuration data that you want to pass to the uh, vertical. And in this case, I want to pass the host of my container and the port of my uh, container. So, and then I just use it, you know, like this um, to, uh, to create my connection options. And then I said the database name, user, and password. Uh, again, this could be externalized, but it's, it, it's only a very quick demo. Um, the key to access my database is to use um, a Postgres pool. So it's my pool of connections to, um, 
to the uh, to the database. Um, then the, the routing is done through a vertex web router. So we have a router uh, which is dealing with products, products plus some ID uh, which is going to be a variable. So you have uh, it's expressed like this. So you have all these you know callbacks to respond, and then we create the HTTP server. Um, and but since we are using the mutiny bindings, uh, it gives us a uni of HTTP server. And once this is done, uh, we just print like this and we say, okay, that's fine. The operation succeeded. If not, the uh, vertical deployment fails with a failure, which is propagated as a failure of the unit. So let me show you the code um, if you want to do queries. Um, so if I want to get all the products, so I want to do select star from products in my database, um, I just, so I get to the pool and I do my query. Uh, so you have stuff for transactions, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do lots of stuff. And then you execute. Uh, when you execute, you're going to get a row set of rows. So you're going to get rows uh, from your database. And this is going to be uni because that query is a one-shot operation. Uh, just, it's not a multi because let me remind you that databases don't stream and don't support back pressure protocols for whatever it means they don't stream right so um i digress but databases don't stream just think about it um so when i execute um i want to say so when i have my i want to transform my rows so when i have my row set um i'm going to transform this into a json array uh, and for each JSON uh, element in the JSON array, I want to have a JSON object uh, which corresponds to the, to, to the row. So I create a new JSON array like this, and for each row in my row set, I add it uh, using the two JSON method from the row, which is turning it into some JSON. Uh, if I have a failure, I just want to recover with an empty JSON array, and that's it. If you want to um, create a product because you have a, a post HTTP request, um, so you get the body of the payload from the post, um, which is the JSON document that was sent to you. Uh, then you do some validation to you know, extract the name, the price, um, check that you have the corresponding values in the uh, JSON. Um, and then finally, you can do the query. So you can do, for example, a prepared query um, with two variables, so the name and the price, uh, which you pass as a tuple. So you pass as a tuple. And then once you have it, you can respond by um, creating a JSON object, which mimics what you posted um, initially, except that you're going to add the row ID, um, which is a new, end, a new value. And same thing if you want to do a query, so you want to get a product uh, with a given ID, uh, you do it like this, you pass a tuple with the variables, and you transform to give it as a JSON or as an empty JSON object. So what you see here is that we have a very simple model to, to, do, um, to do SQL queries. Um, and sometimes it's, it, it's actually very useful to do it this way. Uh, because it's very, it's very simple, you have your SQL, you talk to the database in plain SQL, um, and you manipulate the data, which you may transform to JSON or to something else. Um, in many, many cases, it's just great. Um, so, of course, sometimes it's not what you want. Um, and sometimes you want the familiar model of using an object relational mapper, um, like Hibernate. Um, so hist historically, Hibernate was um, JDBC driven. So you need a JDBC driver to um, to talk to, um, to what well, to, um, to use Hibernate. Sorry, you needed you needed JDBC drivers, but now Hibernate does support reactive as well. So it does support asynchronous I/O, which is great. Um, so how it works is very simple actually. Um, so instead of JDBC, uh, Hibernate Reactive uses the Vertex SQL drivers. Uh, and these drivers 
it's not JDBC drivers that use some thread pool to do stuff because JDBC is blocking. It's really re-implementations that the Vertex project has done. Um, so for example, if you take Postgres, um, we took the protocol of Postgres to re-implement our own driver using non-blocking IO. And if you look at benchmarks like Tech Empower, you will see that whatever is on top in Java, it's using the, um, the Vertex um, uh, reactive drivers. So we have Postgres, MySQL, slash Maria, um, DB2, Microsoft SQL, uh, all the drivers coming. Um, so it's very likely that you find uh, what you need uh, to talk to real database. Um, and then, so Hyper Interactive, you can access it uh, from Mutiny, which is the preferred API. Uh, if you need to, you can use Completion Stage, um, which is a pure, JD, um, pure JDK API. Um, and if you want to use something like Rx Java or Reactor, um, you need to know that Mutiny provides adapters to these libraries. So it's not, it's not really an issue. So let me show how it works. Um, so again, I'm going to um, use Vertex. Um, so same thing as before, we start a container, etc. cetera, it's the same, uh, same API. Um, but this time, instead of doing SQL queries, we have um, uh, an Ibernet entity like this. So that entity is a product. Um, it's very typical, you know, you have uh, this, uh, the primary key as a generated value. Um, you have a column like this for the name, which has to be unique. Um, you have the price, which should not be null, et cetera, et cetera. So it's your typical entity bin that you may find. Um, how do you use it in the, in the, um, in the vertical? Um, so let me show you the configuration first. Um, so you need to configure um, Ibernet uh, with the reactive persistence provider. So that's going to be the reactive uh, provider. And then when you do this, uh, although you see JDBC URL things here, uh, don't worry, it's not using JDBC. It, it is using the Vertex drivers, uh, but just for backward compatibility um, reasons, we use the same properties, uh, the same kind of URL, which starts with JDBC, but it's not JDBC. Um, so that's what we have. Um, the rest is just the, the hibernate that you know. Um, the only thing we need to do, though, is we need to get the port of the um, container that was started by test container and the, and the host. So the port and the host, and we, we just have to override the um, persistence JDBC URL uh, so that it does connect to, uh, to the container. So it, it's all the configuration, basically, we have to do. And then you create your entity manager factory like this. Um, once you have it, you can get a session factory, which is a mutiny session factory, and the rest is is more or less the same as before. Um, if you go, if you want to get all the products, um, so you just talk to your entity manager factory thing. Um, you get a session with the session you do query, which is from product mapping to the entity called product that class and to get the results. Um, if you want to create a product, so you create your entity manually. Um, once you have a session, you persist the product. Uh, chain, so chain is a shortcut from Mutiny, which is um, to chain asynchronous operations. So once this asynchronous persist operation has completed, then you do the asynchronous session flush operation. And once this is done, you replace the result of the flush operation with the product. So um, you will respond some JSON back to the, um, to the client. And same thing, if you want to find by ID, it's fine using the ID. Um, if I run the application, you will see what happens. Um, so it's going to start 
just as usual, uh, it's going to pull the container and start spinning your container for me. And very quickly, you will see um, Hibernate doing its magic. So Hibernate, so I enable the logging of Hibernate and you see that Hibernate has created the schema in terms of tables and, and sequence and stuff. And if I do just a very quick query, well, request like this. So I created a product. So I did two, um, two things here. And you will see that you see the queries, like you see a select form and an insert done by Hibernate. So you see all the stuff Hibernate is, do, is doing. Um, and again, it's on the same event loop thread. Uh, so it's a very efficient model, but you can have the nice um, object, object mapping model that you, you know and use, uh, and use vertex power. So it's really, really nice. And last but last not least, uh, we have Quarkus. So up to here uh, in these examples, I was using Vertex and I was using the uh, reactive SQL drivers. Then I had Hibernate and I had to wire everything together to make it work. Um, so as you saw, it's not, it's not complex work, uh, but you had to assemble all the pieces to make them work together. Um, now, what if you want to have the same power but use a framework, uh, which is all batteries included, and makes you really productive. Uh, and this is where Quarkus come into play because it's a great stack to write all kinds of Java applications, but especially reactive applications. Um, so let me show you how it looks like. So um, in this case, I have only two, um, two objects. Um, so under the hood, it's, it, it's again going to use Ivern Interactive, uh, under the hood, it's still going to use Vertex, but I'm not exactly going to use them, to use them manually. Um, what I'm going to do is use RESTEZ Reactive. So it's your you know, API endpoint. You have a path. You say, I want to get a get method, then I want to list all the products, and I talk to product, and I get all. Um, and it's, you, know, you return a uni or multi to say, um, to say what you want to do. Um, so when I create a product, I say, that's my product. So JSON, which is being automatically mapped uh, to an object. And I can just say product that persists and flash, uh, replaced with product to give it back to, um, to, to, to JSON, etc. cetera. Um, so that's my REST easy, you know, it's a very typical REST easy kind of, uh, kind of endpoint. Um, and then, so I could have the same product entity been as before, um, but in Quarkus, we have something which can be nice as well, which is called Panache. Um, so here we say it's a Panache entity. And it's an, it's an implementation of the active record pattern. So if you've done some Ruby on Rails, uh, you probably, you, of course, you know this, this pattern. Um, so we say we have a product, um, we have two public fields, name and price. Um, I didn't put constraints, but I could uh, just, you know, just as before. And then, uh, because this is an entity, a Panache entity, it has a bunch of predefined methods. Um, so to make usage simple, um, you can create static methods like this. Like you can do things like find all, find by ID, whatever. This is built in into the, um, the entity uh, class. Um, so for example, I find all the values and I stream them. Um, I can do find by name. So I find by name and I get the first result or I, can, I could get some other results or the list or the page, I could do some paging, etc. And that's it, uh, it's all I have. Um, so if I run it, I'm going to, to do it quickly. Um, so I'm going to launch Quarkus in dev mode and again, I'm not going to have to start um, a Postgres container. Container uh, Quarkus is going to do it for me. So when you're in dev mode like this, um, and you're using a database, uh, so like you, you're using entities and you have a database, um, Quarkus is going to automatically create a, a container with the correct database for you, so that in development mode. You know, you don't even have to worry about databases or other kinds of, of middleware. You just, you know, use it and, and, and run it. 
Um, something you may see down, down here is that we have even continuous testing. Um, so if I make changes to my code, it's going to be reloaded. Um, and if you have tests, they're going to be run again for you. Um, so it's, it's a really nice experience because once you run Maven, Quarkus Dev, you, you, just, you just leave it running and you code and you make changes and it's and, and just fine. Um, and again, it's the same API, so products, it's going to respond, et cetera, et cetera. So it's fairly, I think, oh, I have an issue because the port is already taken by something else. So I have, yeah, I have one of my other process which is still running, so it doesn't work. Um, but anyway, you, you you see what I mean. So you have this, you know, continuous deployment thing, which is pretty pretty nice, and it's the same API. So it it would be the same. Uh, there's no point in running it again. But as you see, it's a framework um, kind of experience model. You have a REST easy endpoint, which under the hood is using Vertex. Um, you can have Hibernate Interactive, um, and you can even have Panache, which makes it even simpler to use to connect to databases. And then Quarkus is doing the rest um, with reloading and continuous testing. And then you can even create a native executable if it's something you need for your project. So um, as a conclusion, um, so again, uh, it's, it, it was a presentation around the reactive continuum that we've been doing at Red Hat. Um, because reactive does matter because we want people to be able to build resource efficient services. Vertex is that reactive toolkit which is extremely versatile and we, where you can use we can do lots of things with vertex. Um, and if you need um, a framework experience, so of course you can use Hibernate and Mutiny. So Mutiny makes reactive programming more accessible. Uh, Hibern Interactive makes talking to a database simple yet reactive. Uh, and Quarkus, you know, as an umbrella, is packaging, is packing all, all these projects together and gluing them together with a very good um, uh, development experience. Uh, so it's really, really a nice continuum uh, to make reactive uh, reality for people. Uh, that session was recorded, so now it's time to go to the Q&A, um, of course, live this time. Thank you very much. All right. Looks like we are done. Thank you a lot, Julian, for, for uh, talking through all these reactive libraries, including Mutiny as a core, core library for accessing or getting this like reactive flavor of of paradigm for for building apps for for intro into reactive hibernate into into, into some details of the driver uh, behind the, the 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 hibernate like I wasn't aware that this is just just part of like um, vertex driver used inside hibernate reactive so that was interesting and like this this demo of running all together that was nice since fo since folks who are Kind of the the main the core users of of Hibernate, and they want to get access to to reactive and to asynchronous APIs, and they can do that right now, which is which is great. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, not from from like, uh, from uh, let's see if we have any from. Okay, we have one from from our AD, attendee. Um, question from Alex, is it possible to fetch select as multi with single row as an item? I don't know if, if, if it's clear to you, is it? Um, so you do query like select from something and you want a multi and not a uni of list, right? Um, so in I, hyper interactive, I don't think we have the adapter, although you can go from a unit to a multi if you want to. And you, it's not terribly complex to say, I take the list and I do a multi. Um, in Panache, which is in Quarkus, uh, there is a method uh, which I have in, in the demo, by the way, uh, which gives you a multi. Uh, the only thing is, it's not fully, I mean, that 
so something that I said, which I think is important, is that databases don't stream because you make a request and you get a bunch of rows, right? So there's no real back pressure to be reported. So that this is why we tend to say it's a one-shot operation. Uh, but if you absolutely, if you want to get a multi uh, short answer, yes, you can. Just maybe it's not the the best abstraction because it's not a streaming middleware. Hmm. Okay. And we have another question from Roman. Uh, the question is, um, yeah, actually, it it kind of uh, recalls to my question as well about the mutiny. Uh, the, the Roman asks, reactive application are known to be tricky to analyze in terms of performance. For example, it can be pretty hard to detect blocking calls. Uh, so the question is, what does mutiny do to address those kind of issues? Um, so mutiny itself, it doesn't do anything. Like it's completely orthogonal to your uh, concurrency model. Um, but then um, if you use, so on the vertex side, we have um, an event loop blocking block thread checker. So if you block on the event loop for too long, we will uh, throw um, warnings to you so that you know that you have a problem in your code. And in the case of Quarkus, um, so we have a few methods in mutiny where you can await for the result to be here. Like we have a few methods that uh, go from the reactive world to the blocking world. Uh, like if you want to fetch everything as a list, you can do that. Um, but if you're doing such calls in Quarkus in places where you should not be blocking, then we will just uh, kill, uh, we will just kill the, um, the execution to tell you you have a problem. So it's a few things like this we have, uh, but we don't have a, you know, f yeah, I, I, I get it that it can be complicated, but we have a few, uh, a few tools there and there to help you. Yeah. All right. And uh, yeah, one question from my end. So, I mean, um, as you mentioned, like Mutini API is, is pretty, pretty, pretty kind of short. It just offers the core, the core things and looking into library, it has uh, just few operators, like for for doing some some flatting and doing some core transformations. So, do you think like this is this is commonly enough for for ordinary applications? Since um, we don't usually do some com complex transformation building uh, web applications. So, what is your opinion on that? Uh, you mean in terms of richness of the API, yeah. right? Um, it's it, it's a very good question. It's a very good point. Um, so far, we've been covering cases that we've seen, you know, a demand, or we've seen that it does help, um, you know, expressing certain things in Quarkus and in Vertex uh, for the kind of transformations people are doing. Um, but we, you know, when when we add operators, we just we want to make sure that we have a good use case that shows that we're not just adding it just to make it richer, but we are actually solving a real problem. Um, so for sure, we're not probably not, I mean, no API is going to cover all the possible cases. Um, but one driving thing behind Mutiny is we want to keep it simple and approachable uh, for people who are new to reactive programming. So I think we, what we have right now is a good subset of the th all the things you could be doing. Um, but then, yeah, again, um, when people come with a nice use case for a need for an operator because they have some kind of transformations or um, well, anything they want to express that, that makes sense, um, yeah, we are definitely going to, uh, to support it. All right, so we are... Uh running out of time actually it's it's like 30 seconds to end i guess uh we can continue our conversation at zoom uh sure. where everyone can ask all kind of questions to you julian and uh thank you again for 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 introducing mutiny for talking through whole ecosystem which kind of supports reactive end-to-end -end and offers api with mutiny including database including server and finally, a user can build their API using Reactive Library. So thank you a lot, and let's continue at Zoom. Thanks, everyone. See you.